Today is April 15th, 2021, and my guest is journalist and author Jason Riley. He's a fellow at the Manhattan Institute and a columnist for The Wall Street Journal. His latest book coming out soon is Maverick, a biography of Thomas Sowell. I want to thank the Union League Legacy Foundation for partnering with us on this episode. This was part of a live webinar last month. Jason, welcome to Econ Talk. Thank you. Our topic for today is race and with some politics and economics. Let's start with the black experience today, this moment, 2021. Is the glass half full or half empty? Well, I'm an optimist, uh, Russ, so I, I, I kind of always see it as, as half uh, full. Um, the question is always, for me, whether um, people are taking advantage of the opportunities that exist today. I think there is no doubt that there are more such opportunities. Um, but um, uh, the question, again, is whether, whether people are taking advantage of them and, and whether... Uh, our debates are about that uh, versus um, other things that I consider um, more or less distractions from whether people are taking the initiative that they have today. And, and so I think that's largely where our, where our debates are. And, you know, I, I'm, I'm a journalist. Uh, I'm part of the um, uh, frequently disparaged mainstream media, elite mainstream media, in fact. And I think uh, part of the problem we have today is in how uh, our coverage of these racial issues is taking place. And, um, you know, part of that has to do with social media today and the ability of um, uh, things to go viral, um, things that are rare to be presented as commonplace. And um, we can talk about, uh, you know, some examples of that, obviously. But, um, but by and large, I, 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 I feel very uh, blessed to live at a time in America when there have never been more opportunities for, uh, for minorities, for blacks and others. Um, I, I think that's manifest uh, the fact that immigrants are still currently, as we speak, on the border trying to push their way into this country <laughs> because they, they see opportunity here. They see a way to better themselves in their situation. And that continues. Uh, and so, uh, again, the question is whether the people here are taking that advantage of the opportunities that do exist. Well, there's obviously some serious barriers to taking advantage of those opportunities, and, and we'll talk about those. But you made a reference, an illusion, I thought, when you're talking about issues that are in the news and the mainstream media and, and social media. You know, right now, April 15th, we're in the middle of a lot of tragedy and turmoil and death related to the relationship between you know, black communities and the police. Um, what are your thoughts on that, that issue uh, in terms of, of where you think it stands and, and what needs to get done to make it better? Well, I, I, I think that there is a preoccupation with, uh, within the media of, of breaking down these encounters between uh, blacks and the police. Um, uh, by race without breaking down um, criminality by race. They want to talk about one without the other. And I think that presents a very distorted view of, of what's going on uh, out there for the general public. And, and that gets to what I was referencing when I said that um, social media has played a role here in that distortion. Uh, so you have these encounters between the police uh, and, and, and blacks that gain more attention, uh, but that does not necessarily mean that they're happening more often, Russ, yet that is the impression being given through uh, the coverage of these, of these incidents. And, and, and so, um, uh, you know, just to give you a, uh, some context here, um, uh, you know, the, the percentage of, of black homicides in this country that um, involve police is quite small. Uh, the tragedy is the number of black homicides in this country. Uh, and it's you know, legitimately viewed as a tragedy, but the number that involves police as a percentage of those homicides is quite small. I mean, just a quick example, in, in, in Chicago in, in 2019, there were 492 homicides 
according to the Chicago Sun-Times, which has kept a tally of these, uh, of those 492, three involve police. Three out of 492. So we can talk about improving policing. We can talk about um, you know, whether it should be easier to fire cops or or, or whether they should not have the immunity that they're automatically granted in certain situations and so forth. Uh, th- those are legitimate debates to have. Sure. But to me, they seem second order issues here. Uh, you know, 98, 97% of black homicides in this country do not involve law enforcement. Uh, if we're worried about uh, black lives per se, if we want to reduce that body count, should our focus be on um, the 3% or 2% of black homicides that involve cops or the 98% that don't? And, and, and my concern is that uh, the focus has been uh, on the latter. And, and that is not only um, disturbing uh, as, as a practical matter, um, it's disturbing to the extent that uh, it could lead to uh, less effective policing of these communities that most need effective policing. In other words, when you make police the targets, when you put uh, uh, the emphasis on them, when you, when you start to scapegoat them for these outcomes, it has an impact on these communities. Police pull back. They uh, are more reluctant to get out of their cars or, or take their time getting to the crime scene in response to a 9-11 call. And all that does is empower the criminals in these communities who by and large prey on poor black people. And we've seen this in, in, in city after city after city. This is not speculation. This is not anecdotal. It has been shown in empirical studies that when you scapegoat cops after these high profile incidences, they pull back. Crime increases, violent crime increases, and the uh, most likely victims of those uh, of that increase are, are are poor blacks. Yeah, well, the governance of the police in America is a whole separate issue. I think you know, I think you're right. I think there's some evidence that they do pull back. Uh, the real puzzle then is who is it, who's in charge? Uh, you know, why wouldn't why wouldn't police chiefs say uh, do your job? But the, they don't. There, there's a certain autonomy to police in America that is. Well, police uh, are endogenous, like any other group. Yeah. I mean, they're not automatons. They're going to respond uh, to being scapegoated. And, and that's what we see what we see happening. Well, let's talk, you know, you alluded to the role the media plays, obviously, in, in this perception, the three out of uh, 492, the other 300, 489, or was it, yeah, uh, 489. Obviously, one reason we don't spend much time on them is that they're usually not filmed. We don't have a lot of video footage of those tragic deaths, uh, the homicides that that uh, are not at the hands of the police. I don't think that's why we don't focus on them. Tell I me think why. We don't focus on them because it's not a politically expedient to focus on them. Who benefits from focusing on them? When you look at the people who who focus on police shootings, it's very obvious who benefits. If you're a civil rights organization who wants to keep race front and center, and wants to pretend like it's still 1960 in America, then you focus on police violence. You focus on uh, police shootings of black people. You have no incentive to focus on non-police shootings of black people, even if that is the overwhelming majority of police shootings. So this is a matter of incentives. Yeah, Yeah, I I, I don't think, I I think it's quite easily explained. If you're an activist, uh, this is how you raise money. Um, if you're a politician, uh, this is how you drive blacks to the polls. Uh, th- there are incentives in place to keep um, front and center what has been front and center in, in, in this situation involving police and black suspects. And there's also an incentive to play down um, black crime rates. I mean, the, the reality is that there is a legitimate reason why police are focused on these communities. This is where the 9-11 calls originate. There, there is no doubt about that. Um, police, you know, blacks call police more than any other group in America. 
it's a funny way of showing you don't trust cops. And, and, and the other thing that's going on here is that black elites, uh, whether they're civil rights uh, leaders or, or, or black politicians or black activists, have been able to drive this debate in the media. Um, the media turns to them to express the views of black Americans writ large. And uh, uh, it was mentioned in the introduction that I just completed a biography of, uh, of, of Thomas Sowell, uh, a black intellectual economist based at the Hoover Institution, Stanford University. And in, in researching the book on Sowell, um, I listened to a, any number of interviews he had done over the, over the decades. And uh, one question he was repeatedly asked, and I find myself repeatedly asked, was how does it feel as a black person uh, who's more conservative, right of center, politically, um, to be so out of step with other black people? And, and Sol responded that uh, by correcting the premise of the question. And he would say, um, you mean how does it feel to be out of step with black elites? Uh, black elites, he'd say, are no more representative of black people than white elites are of white people. And, 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 and so that is something to keep in mind when we, when we have these debates. Uh, you know, in, 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 in recent months and years, this whole defunding the police uh, narrative has taken place. And, and the media repeatedly you know, turns to these black spokesmen, so-called. Uh, oh yes, the, 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 the police are the, are the biggest problem in these communities. Policing is the big, not black criminality. Policing is the biggest problem in these communities. We need to, to, to reimagine policing. We need to, 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 to uh, re, 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 uh, direct resources that are going into law enforcement. And this is the view of the black community writ large. Well, um, I, I was always skeptical. Of, of this line of reasoning, uh, not only because I've lived in uh, these poor black communities, I've worked in these poor black, I've gone to school in these poor black communities. And in my personal experience, um, this has never been the attitude that I've heard um, uh, among, among black people that policing is the problem. So I was always, I was always skeptical, but there, there is reason to be, to be skeptical of this. And let me just, walk you through a little bit of the polling on actual black people who live in these communities. And so in, in, in a Gallup poll released in 2020 showed that 81% of black Americans said they wanted police presence in their neighborhood to remain the same or to increase. This is 2020. Um, uh, another Gallup survey published in 2020, asked Black and Hispanic residents of low-income neighborhoods specifically about policing. And 59% of both Black and Hispanic respondents said that, quote, they would like the police to spend more time in their area than they currently do. Uh, a 2015 Gallup poll taken right after Michael Brown was killed in Ferguson, Missouri, asked Black, uh, respondents about policing. A majority said that police treat them fairly. And more blacks than whites said they wanted, quote, a greater police presence in their local community. And this is not a recent phenomenon, Russ. I can quote you polls going back to the 1990s about the importance of crime control among black residents in poor black communities. Uh, uh, a poll in 1993 taken by Gallup found that 82% of black respondents said the criminal justice system doesn't treat criminals harshly enough. 75% of blacks wanted more cops on the street to combat crime. 68% said build more prisons so that longer sentences can be given. So this is going back 30 odd years and we could go back even further. So, so we can talk about the defund the police movement. We can talk about what the activists are saying, but we cannot pretend that these folks are speaking on behalf 
of the black rank and file. Based on the empirical data that we have, they are speaking for themselves. And too often the media has interpreted what they're saying as speaking on behalf of all blacks. And that is very much part of the problem. It's part of what we saw in all these street protests over the summer about George Floyd. People really think there's some sort of epidemic going on out there of police targeting young black men. Uh, the fact is that the, 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 there is no empirical data to support that narrative. In, in New York City, where I'm based, uh, it so happens that the police department has kept very detailed records of police shootings uh, over, over the decades, uh, going all the way back to the early 1970s. So in, in 1971, police in New York City shot 300 people. Uh, by 1991, 20 years later, that had fallen to 100 people. By 2019, it had fallen to 34 people. So police use of lethal force has declined by roughly 80, 85 percent in the nation's largest city with the nation's largest police force over the past half century. And New York is no outlier. You will find the same stats in Los Angeles and Chicago and Detroit and Cleveland and Oakland. You go down the line. Police use of lethal force has declined, especially among minorities. Yet we have groups out there claiming the exact opposite, that it's increasing, that it has become an epidemic. And I really think that this is largely a function of uh, the media dropping the ball and refusing to put things in perspective and cite the sort of data I just cited. Well, you're also suggesting, I love it, that the, uh, the man who, who's just finished a biography of Thomas Sowell is lecturing The Economist about incentives, uh, which is something I'm a big fan of thinking about. But it is, it's interesting in this area, it, it's easy to forget. I'll be a little less uh, mercenary than you are. Uh, it attention is what's valuable uh, in today's. It's the coin that many people are eager to to pocket, and I think the um, attention yes, control, controlling the narrative yeah. is more important than having the facts on your yeah. side. Uh, you you'll have no no dispute from me on, on on that. It's unfortunate, but that's where we are. The facts can be completely at odds with the Let, prevailing narrative, and it doesn't seem to matter. Well, some people would argue that. You know, no matter how few people are killed by reckless police or, you know, negligent police or worse, you know, malicious or racist police, it's too many people. I, for me, the problem is, is one, of, again, of governance. Um, police unions are very powerful. There's very little – the chiefs of police in America have less control over their staff than, than I think would be healthy. Uh, but they like that too. They have an incentive for that Again, to be the case we, as well. We can have that debate. We can have that discussion. It's 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 an important discussion. Police reform uh, is idea. an important discussion. Yeah, it's should, a good should, idea. A, should a should a police officer who's fired from one department be able to move into another jurisdiction and and get a job at, at another police department without having that history of being followed? You know, follow him. Uh, should these uh, immunity laws that police have, are they legitimate? Should they, those are all legitimate, very legitimate questions to have. And I have no doubt that there are racist cops out there, just like there are racists in any number of fields. I'm not someone who believes that racism has been vanquished from America. The question is, you know, does racism explain the outcomes we see today in the criminal justice system? Or does behavior explain those outcomes and then that, that 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 is the question but but the the, the idea that we have the, the the policing has become the centerpiece of a national discussion to me is completely at odds i it's a, with with what's actually going on and these young black men in 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 in, in chicago or minneapolis or oakland or new york may in fact leave the house every day, Russ, worried about getting shot, but not by police officers. Yet if you listen to the media, <laughs> that is what you think would yeah. be the problem here. Yeah, no, that's a tragedy all around in so many ways. We're, let's, let's take a little deeper into the, 
the behavior you're talking about and the issues that you think we ought to be spending more time on, you, you've spoken very eloquently and, and written eloquently on the lessons of, of history for the black experience, in particular, what we should learn from the period after the Civil War up through the Civil Rights Act in the mid-1960s. Uh, uh, that century, that hundred years, there were things to learn from that. In particular, um, there was some quite a bit of improvement in, in the situation of, of black people, despite Jim Crow, despite the handicaps. Uh, what do you learn from that? Well, I, I learned that Jim Crow and the legacy of slavery are not you know, blanket explanations for black outcomes today. Uh, there's no doubt that, that, that those events had a profound impact on the black experience in this country. There's no doubt to me that uh, discrimination and prejudice and bias can in fact play a role in a minority group's upward mobility. You know, the question is how big a role is it playing? How much of what is going on today does it explain? And I would argue that it explains quite little given the, the, the amount of progress that was taking place when you had far more uh, racial discrimination in America than you have today. A lot of people look at these black crime rates and they say poverty, you know, well, obviously you know, blacks are, are much poorer than whites on average. And so uh, higher black crime rates uh, make sense. These are desperate people, which you know, might sound logical uh, superficially until you realize that in the 1930s and 40s and 50s, black people were a lot poorer than they are today. And black crime rates were a lot lower than they are today. So this correlation that is just thrown out there uh, between poverty and crime rates does not hold up to scrutiny. Um, you, you know, the, 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 the poverty rate among black married couples has been in the single digits for more than a quarter century. You know, black people don't become less black after they get married. So uh, is the poverty rate in America a function of racism or family formation? Is it a function of the fact that you see fewer married couples among blacks? But we don't talk about that. We jump right to the racial explanation or the racist explanation of these outcomes. And I think uh, that's a mistake. Um, and for some groups, um, uh, they willfully ignore that reality because they have an entirely different agenda. And I, and, I, and I just think it's incumbent upon the media people in my profession to challenge these folks when they cite racism as a, as a blanket explanation, as an all-purpose explanation for racial disparities, whether it's in you know, educational achievement or, or employment or, or income or any number of other measures. There are other explanations that I think are far more plausible in the 21st century than simply racism. Go ahead. What would you, how would you explain the, you know, some people would argue that uh, in the, it seems so long ago, I think it was the 80s when cocaine was very popular. Um, white people took cocaine and eh, they didn't pay such a high price for it. But when it was black people taking other drugs, they all went to jail for a long time. We cracked down on that in a very disproportionate way. I mean, I think drug policy in the United States has been a, a terrible uh, had a terrible impact on the on the on the black community and and white community obviously as well, but I think it's been disproportionately on the black community. Uh, now, is that racist? Is it? Where's that coming from? I don't know. Uh, would you comment on that and also comment on the what you think are the the behavioral parts of this problem and particularly the family issues that that I I know you've you've written about. Well, in, in terms of the drug war, I think there's a little revisionist history going on here. Um, you mentioned the 1980s and the crack epidemic of that period um, that led to legislation being passed that treated uh, crack cocaine offenses more harshly than powder cocaine offenses. And of course- That's what I meant. Thank you. Blacks, <laughs> blacks were um, uh, 
more likely to use crack cocaine than, than, than powder. powder cocaine, which is more prevalent among whites. Um, what people leave out of that story is who led the fight for passing legislation uh, that differentiated between sentencing for penalties for crack cocaine versus powder cocaine. Um, it was the Congressional Black Caucus. People like Charlie Rangel and Major Owens, congressman from New York City, led the fight to install those differentials that are in hindsight, all these decades later, suddenly viewed as racist. People conveniently forget who pushed for this because of what crack cocaine was doing to their communities. And you can go, go all the way back to Nelson Rockefeller and the Rockefeller drug laws in the early 1970s. Black leaders in, in black communities led the push for the drug law uh, war in the first place. Um, uh, the crime control has long been uh, something that black leaders uh, have been preoccupied with, and rightly so, because violent crime uh, has disproportionately harmed their community. So, so there's a little revisionism going on right there and in, in, in going back and rewriting what the motivations were and who was pushing what, when, um, and why. Uh, but beyond that, um, just as a practical matter, I think there are very good arguments that uh, some uh, conservatives, libertarians, liberals make about the merits of the drug war. Uh, whether it's doing any good, I think there are, are, are very good arguments on both sides of this effect as to whether um, it's been a bust. Um, so to speak. But, but, if, but if your goal is to, uh, A, uh, reduce mass incarceration, or B, reduce um, the racial disparities among our incarcerated population, among the prison population, uh, going after the drug war is barking up the wrong tree. And here's why. Uh, blacks are about 13% of uh, the population. They're about 37% of the incarcerated population in this country. If you were to send home everyone who was incarcerated for a drug offense, uh, that disparity, that racial disparity would barely budge. Blacks would still be right about 37% of the incarcerated population. Um, nor would you address mass incarceration. America would still have the largest incarcerated population in the Western world <laughs> if you sent home everyone who was in American prisons on drug offenses. Yeah, it's so, a little... so, so, so you would not address the mass incarceration problem by ending the drug war, nor would you address the racial disparity problem. And here's why. Uh, the, what is driving the black incarceration rate? They're not drug offenses. They're violent offenses. Blacks commit violent crimes at seven to 10 times the rate that other groups do. And according to the most recent figures I've seen, uh, among the people who are incarcerated, uh, violent criminals make up about 53% of the prison population. Um, about 19% of the people in prison are there for property offenses. Drug offenses come in third at around 16%, or less than a third of the violent offenders in prison. So what again, what is driving uh, the black uh, incarceration rate, it's not drug offenses. But some of violent offenses. But some of those violent offenses are the result of turf wars over drug dealing and there, there is some artificially of that. There is, higher. There is some of that. But yeah. even among even among the drug offenders, we're not locking up people who have been caught with a dime bag because they were frisked by some cops for standing on a street corner. The people who get locked up in prison for drugs are dealers, Russ. They're yeah. traffickers. Yeah, yeah. That's who we're locking up. So uh, uh, again, there, there are very good reasons for ending the drug war, uh, I would argue. But again, if your goal is to reduce that uh, 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 this racial disparity in incarceration rates, ending the drug war is not going to get you there. So what role does, does the family play in this, in your view? 
Oh, I think it, I think it plays a huge role. I mean, the, the correlation between uh, uh, you know, uh, violent crime in these communities, incarceration rates in these communities, and intact black families is quite strong. Yeah, you're you're an economist, and and, Inverse, and like a me, negative correlation. And, and, yes, and 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 like me, you're you're reluctant to try and make causal links here. But the correlation between when you had more intact black families and what crime rates were at that time is quite is quite revealing. Um, I I can give you a, a, a few figures on that. Um, uh, so. Uh, for instance, in 1960, black men were murdered at a rate of 45 per 100,000. By 1990, that had climbed to 140 per 100,000, an increase of more than 200%. Was there more racism in 1990 than there was in 1960 for us? I mean, does, does, does racism really explain uh, what was going on? I mean, in 1960 in the South, you had police departments in places like Alabama that were like a third of them were members of the Klan <laughs> openly. I mean, the, the, the idea that <laughs> racist policing today is responsible for the incarceration rates that we see today or the arrest rates that we see today uh, is preposterous from a historical perspective. So, so what did you have going on back in 1960 or 1950 or 1930 and 40? You had more black intact families. In fact, between 1890 and 1940, black marriage rates, according to the census, were higher than white marriage rates in these country in, in these uh, in, in the country. Um, uh, as late as the 1960s. Uh, two out of three black children were being raised in a home with a uh, with a mother and a father. Uh, today, you know, uh, in some of these communities, upwards of eighty percent are not. And yes, I do think this has a lot to do with why these young men in Chicago are running around shooting each other. Yes, I, I, I think that does, in fact, play play a role. You know, you know what's other what, what's also interesting about the first half of the twentieth century is that you had this migration out of the South of black people. It's large, these several large migrations out of the South. And, um, and even um, when people did not leave the South, they left rural areas and headed into cities. And we know historically that cities are much more violent places than rural areas in these countries. So you would have expected uh, black violent crime rates to increase in say the 1940s and the 1950s. In fact, the opposite happened. In the 1940s, uh, homicide rates for black men fell by more than 18%. And in the 1950s, they fell by even more, by more than 20%. At the same time when white homicide rates were basically flat in this country. And I think that's quite remarkable uh, given, again, the trends in terms of urban areas being much more violent than rural areas historically. Well, let's talk about, I hope we get to the question of why you think the black family has done so poorly in terms of family st structure. Uh, but I want to ask you about education and, and a phrase that uh, comes from economics, but I like your richer use of it, which is human capital. So one argument would be, I'm not going to call it racist on the part of um, teachers unions, but the inability to allow reform, the barriers to reform of the schooling system, I think have differentially punished uh, black communities at a time when education is increasingly important. So it's not, I mean, I'm not going to argue that schooling was always great and it's gotten worse. Probably it was pretty bad before and it's still bad now in, in poor neighborhoods in America, black or white. But it's a, we live at a time where education is increasingly important. And I, my view is, is that too many young people in America are not given the tools they need to contribute and to earn and to hold their head up with dignity in the, in the modern economy. 
And I'd like your take on that. Um, what do you think? Well, I, I think you're I think you're absolutely right. I mean, well, I, I'd start by saying human capital is in my term, uh, Ross. I mean, this no, is but Gary you, you, Becker. This is no, Gary. This is the Chicago School. No, but no, but the reason <laughs> I mentioned the reason I mention it is that a really bad economist uh -huh. thinks that human capital means how many years you sat at a desk in a school no, building. Oh, okay. Okay. A good economist realizes that human capital has to be related to skill acquisition yeah. and other things. Yeah. But yeah. you broaden it to to include cultural factors that I think are un neglected by economists. Yeah, and and, and not me, and not only me. I mean, I, I, yeah. I again, I would go back to the those, those Chicago school economists like uh, like Gary Becker and like Tom Sowell, right? Yeah. Um, uh, who 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 use a definition of care, of human capital that involves skills. And behaviors and attitudes and culture, and and the argument there is that um, if you get those things right, what we've seen is that minority groups, ethnic and racial minority groups, can overcome all kinds of of, of, of discrimination or bias or structural this and that or legacies of this or that in their history, um, and and we see this time and and and, and time again is played out not only uh, uh, here in the US with certain ethnic groups, but around the world, whether you're talking about the, the, uh, the, you know, the ethnic Chinese in Southeast Asia, uh, whether you're talking about South Asians in, in, in East Africa, um, whether you're talking about Jews in any number of countries around the world down through history. Uh, what, what is between your ears is not something larger society can control. And so during, you know, the times of czarist Russia, when you know eighty or ninety percent of the public was uh, illiterate, uh, most Jews had books in their homes. Uh, it didn't matter what the greater society's view of education was; they had a tradition, they had a culture that valued education, and it followed them wherever they went. Whether it was into a country like czarist Russia, where education was not valued, or whether they went anywhere else, and that has followed them down through history. And so, if, if a group gets that right, um, uh, that, that human capital factor, right? It matters more than discrimination. It's not that discrimination or racism or prejudice doesn't matter. It's that human capital ma matters more, and 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 so that is why I think some of us have focused so much on the development of that human capital, so that it doesn't matter who gets elected or or who's in office and so forth. If 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 you're a group that has valued skills and behaviors. To advance, particularly in a free market economy, you're going to do just fine. If you look at who's hitting it out of the park right now in America, Asian Americans, uh, you go, how much political clout do, we, do Asian Americans have in this country? Not much. Um, and yet you see them overrepresented in, skilled, uh, in the skilled professions. You see Harvard so panicked about them that they're, 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 they're trying to keep them out. Uh, the way they did Jews yeah. uh, in, in the, the early part of the yeah. 20th century. I, I mean, that that is what human capital gets you. And it's not just at the collegiate level. Here in New York City, uh, where I am, uh, even in the selective high schools, you see um, politicians trying to curb Asian enrollment in schools because uh, these students are, are doing so well. And the politicians want more racial balance. And what's... What's, what's interesting about this is that if you look at a, a more detailed breakdown of the Asian students who are accepted at these more selective schools, at least here in New York, they come from disadvantaged backgrounds. Many of them come from some, some of the poorer zip codes in the outer boroughs where, where their parents are solidly working class, but where they have uh, uh, cultural traits that prioritize you know, uh, SAT test prep over three hundred dollars sneakers. That's cultural for us. That 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 is that, that, that is not something uh, that is the result of, of prejudice from 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 society. And yet these kids are are outperforming middle class and upper class black and 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 white kids to be admitted to these schools. Um, and and so again, it, it talks that gets back to the primacy. Of, of, of human capital. And, oh. and, and that is why I think um, so many of us focus on the importance of education as a way of economic advancement.
and upward mobility. And unfortunately, in this country, um, you know, we have 85 or so percent of kids educated in public schools, which are controlled by and large by teachers unions. And teachers unions see public education as really more of a jobs program for adults. Uh, and, 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 and so that explains the tenure rules, the last hired, first fired, the inability of, of a principal to put the most experienced kids in, the most, to te- in front of the most difficult kids to teach and so forth. Um, that, that explains a lot of what is going on in, 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 in public education here in America. And that's why a lot of us work and, and advocate for more school choice and, 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 and introducing more competition into public education. Uh, oh. Because uh, right now we're in a situation basically where we were with the post office, you know, 30 years ago uh, before UPS and FedEx came along and put some competitor pre- competitive pressure on the post office to improve what it was doing. Well, I, re- yeah, I remember in the uh, documentary Waiting for Superman, how a really horrible teacher could just get shuttled to a different school system and get a new start, which is somewhat reminiscent of the union power you mentioned earlier with rogue uh, police officers. Um, something there to be think about. I, I want to allude, I want to mention something you mentioned before, though, which I think is very important. You're talking about human capital. As you pointed out, people risk their lives to come into the United States to be poor because they believe, these are immigrants, they believe that they will not stay poor, sure. that their children will not stay poor. And I know uh, there's work that's been done recently by uh, former uh, past econ talk guest uh, Ron Abramitsky with uh, co-author Leah Bustan, and I forget the uh, third co-author, I apologize. I think there's three. That, that the mobility of immigrants in the United States hasn't changed. It's still very high, despite these claims about that everybody in America is just, you know, treading water, which I think is a misinterpretation of the data, as listeners get tired of me talking about sometimes. But, but I think that point about immigration is incredibly important. Now, it could be just they're deluded. They, they think this is a land where the streets are paved with gold. But in fact, it seems to be borne out by their actual experience. Um, so I, I think that's that's uh, that's a, that's a very uh, that's a very important point. I, I think you're you're absolutely right. And and the the thing about the immigration data is that it does undermine um, all the talk we hear on the left about um, stagnation and how um, yeah. there is no more upward mobility in America. That is not true when it comes to immigrants, which leads to the question of whether. Uh, what I what I started out saying uh, in my opening remarks, whether people are taking advantage of the opportunities yeah. that do exist, and then it comes down to why they are or are not taking advantage of the opportunities, not a question of whether those opportunities exist or not. And I think immigrants continue to show that um, those opportunities do exist. And, I, and and these are humans; they act rationally, just like everyone else. And and so, if the opportunities weren't here, they wouldn't come. I mean, you know this. These these immigrants are so plugged in to what is happening uh, economically in in America that there are economists who who look at, at at immigrant movements as leading economic indicators of where the economy is headed in the U.S. Interesting. That's how tuned in these folks are. If if somebody in Boston or Chicago or Seattle says to someone south of the border. Don't come. There are no jobs here. Don't come. They don't come. When there are recessions, we see fewer immigrants coming. And, 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 and so I think they are acting very rationally. And my, 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 my concern is that um, it goes back to, to, to what Milton Friedman uh, famously said, which is that you can't have open immigration and, and a, a large welfare state because eventually – uh, it will turn into a welfare magnet. And we've seen that in, in various parts of Western Europe where, where people migrate for the public benefits. And, and for many years, for many decades, we've had strong evidence in the U.S. that that is not why they come here. Well, they come uh, here to we work. Knew that, they come here we to work. Be- <laughs> well, yeah, they come Most here to work. And we, and we know that because of, of, of largely because of where they go. I mean, for, for in the past 20 years or so, the, the, the fastest growing immigrant populations have been in states like you know, Tennessee and Arkansas and the Carolinas and so forth. These are not places that are known for generous welfare benefits for us. 
<laughs> these are places known for quite stingy welfare benefits. So yet that is not where people have gone uh, upon arriving in the U.S. So they, we, we know that they are coming for the jobs. But what I do fear is that as we continue to increase the size of the welfare state, and I think we made a big step in that direction with Obamacare, and we've continued down that road, uh, particularly uh, with the current administration, uh, and what you see going on in the state level in these blue states where they are actually, New York uh, is having a debate right now of over how much money to give to illegal immigrants uh, who are harmed by COVID. Uh, the, the, this is a state that is simultaneously having a debate on whether to become the highest tax state in the country. So we want to raise taxes on the most productive people in the state to give welfare benefits to people who are in the country illegally. That to me is a recipe for creating the welfare magnet situation that Milton Friedman warned us about. And, and so that is, that is my concern. Even if you can argue right now that they're not coming for welfare benefits, as we continue to expand the size of the welfare state, that argument is gonna be harder and harder to make. You know, to defend the left for a minute, which I always enjoy doing when I can, um, one might argue that, well, you know, we don't know much about culture. So it's all well and good to say we need to improve the culture, say, of a particular ethnic community, or we could laud the culture of another one. Um, we don't really have the levers, the policy levers to, to quote, fix that. So we're kind of stuck with that. And so to focus on that's a mistake. I think that's what a lot of people would argue. Uh, and so we focus on the stuff like the racism and the police enforcement and other issues that we think we can control. What do you? What's your answer to that? Well, I, I, I don't know that we can control what we think we can control. And 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 the the, the question is what kind of goals we've set. Uh, you know, we we there are some of us who believe that racism is part of of human nature. We take a very tragic view. Of humanity, <laughs> there there are things that 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 will will forever be with us: war, inequality, racism, and so forth. The crooked and, and, timber and the goal of humanity. Is not to, the, the the goal is not to eradicate these things. I mean, we we can hope to eradicate them, but realistically, what, what the goal should be to put in place institutions and processes that manage these situations. The rule of law. Um, you know, uh, 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 a military defense. I want world peace as much as I'm sure you do, Russ, but it's unlikely Maybe to not. happen. <laughs> <laughs> so so um, uh, the, the problem with a, a, a lot of these political solutions is, 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 is that they're ut utopian. And, 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 and they set up uh, this utopian outcome um, as the goal and say, until we reach it, we can continue to tinker. And a lot of that tinkering, I think, has made matters a lot worse. A affirmative action would be, uh, I think, a very, a very good example of this. You know, well-intended policy to help uh, more blacks uh, uh, join the middle class, uh, create the, uh, the, the number of more black professionals in this country and so forth. Uh, and so in, in places like higher education, we put in place uh, systems where we lowered standards for black applicants. Uh, but what happened? We, we ended up with, with more black uh, dropouts, uh, black kids who went into to, to college wanting to be scientists or mathematicians, uh, subsequently switching to easier majors because they were mismatched with schools. And, 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 and we had this sort of natural experiment play out in many places. And then we, we, we learned that after the University of California system ended, uh, racial preferences in higher education. Wow, black graduation rates went up, including in the more difficult majors like math and science. So a policy that had been put in place to increase the ranks of the black middle class had in, in practice resulted in fewer uh, black doctors, and lawyers, and architects and accountants and so forth. And so I, I think our public policymakers uh, need to be a little more humble about what they do and don't know and what they can and can't do. And, and, and largely this involves getting out of the way 
um, uh, as, uh, which is why I wrote a, 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 a book called Please Stop Helping Us. <laughs> well, I think it's an incredibly important point that is often forgotten that there are many problems in the world. Uh, racism would be one of them. Uh, crime, cruelty. There's, there's, it's a long list. Uh, 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 the question isn't, are there things we wish were different? The question is, do we have tools available to make them better? And I often quote Thomas Sowell, and we'll segue to your biography of him now. Uh, I, he may have he may have heard this from uh, George Stigler. I don't know. Maybe you'll tell me that when given a policy um, solution, so called solution. First of all, Sol famously said, uh, "There are no solutions, only trade offs," which I think is the essence, in many ways, of the economic way of thinking. But he also would say, "And then what? Uh, what comes next? Okay, okay, it's well intentioned. What are the consequences of it?" And I think you know what I think separates people like um, like you from others isn't that you're cruel and heartless, Jason, but rather that you care about consequences and outcomes rather than intentions and motives. At least that's one attractive way that I defend <laughs> my views when I'm called cruel, cruel and heartless. I always say we want the same thing. We disagree on how to get there. And I think your policies, say the minimum wage that someone advocates for, actually hurts people we're trying to help. Um, so I, I think that's, you know, I think that's in many ways one of Seoul's most important legacies. Do you agree? Intellectual legacies. Oh, oh, oh ab ab absolutely. Um, uh, that is that is one of his his legacies, and and uh, along with um, um, his his belief that um, we should have no expectation of equal outcomes among groups to begin with. That this yeah. is a entirely unrealistic utopian uh, goal and objective and, and, and starting point. And, and to say that um, because there are racial disparities in, 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 in this area or that area is automatic evidence that something nefarious is amiss uh, is, is his starting point. He's saying, wait, why, why, why are you assuming that um, – that we would have equal, particularly in a place like America, where you have people who, who, who have come here from cultures uh, that vary uh, geographically, uh, climate-wise, um, uh, in all kinds of ways, uh, that they would all come to America, uh, uh, we'd send them to the, the PS15, and sit them all next to each other in a classroom, and uh, we would get equal scores on tests, and they'd all get into Harvard. And if they don't, something's wrong. Harvard's discriminating. Uh, th this is preposterous, this, this, this whole mindset that we assume um, that equal outcomes are the norm is not something borne out in, in, in history, not here in, a, in, in the U.S., not elsewhere, not today, not yesterday, not 500 years ago. Um, disparate outcomes are, are, are in fact the norm, and that the fact that we hold them up as as commonplace, and 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 and, and view any any discrepancy from them as as problematic or as a as a problem in and of itself, is 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 the wrong way to go about uh, public policy making. But what we haven't talked about, and we should, um, you know, we talked about the opportunities that, that many people in America have taken advantage of, at different ethnic groups. And blacks, of course, have improved greatly their, their economic well-being over the last hundred years. But they came from the legacy of slavery, unlike those immigration groups. Does that matter? A lot of people would argue that is the essential fact. They would argue that the United States was founded as a slave nation and that that legacy has continued to burden Black communities, you're an exception. Uh, Thomas Sowell's an exception. You're just not relevant. Your your ability to to thrive, you're just uh, you know you're you're a footnote. The overwhelming experience of of black people has been inevitably irrevocably damaged by the legacy of slavery, and we should begin with reparations and a recognition that 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 legacy is.
is is incredibly important. Do you agree? Well, what one problem I have with that argument is the the progress being made by blacks um, who lived much closer to the institution of slavery and Jim Crow. Uh, so, you know, b- b- between uh, 1940 and 1960, uh, the black poverty rate fell uh, by 40 percentage points in this country, from 87% to 47%. And that was before any civil rights legislation of, of any significance had been passed. That was before affirmative action had been passed. That was before the Civil Rights Act or the Voting Rights Act had been The Great passed. Society. The Great <laughs> Society had been put in place. And so I look at the progress that was made under those circumstances. That, that, that was being made at a time when you could put a, a sign in your window that said, we don't hire black people. It was perfectly legal to do so. And, 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 and so I look at that, that progress, and it wasn't just a reduction in poverty. If you look at the rate at which uh, blacks were increasing uh, uh, their levels of education, not only in absolute terms, but well, relative to, to white increases in schooling. If you look at uh, income uh, uh, rates, if you look at home ownership rates, uh, if you look at the level at which uh, blacks were entering the skilled professions, middle-class professions, doctors, lawyers, teachers, social workers, accountants, and so forth. Uh, All of that was happening at a much faster rate among generations of blacks that were much closer to the institution of slavery and Jim Crow. And so I find that uh, that explanation wanting in that that respect. And again, and that is not to say that slavery and Jim Crow have had no impact at all on, 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 on the situation that blacks face today. The question is how much do they uh, explain? And, and um, I, 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 I'm, I'm looking at right now a, a Bureau of Labor Statistics news release from January of this year. And it's about uh, median weekly earnings in America. And it says blacks um, and Hispanics um, uh, are lower than whites in their earnings, but whites are lower than Asians. And Hispanics are lower than blacks. And, and this always complicates the sort of facile explanation that uh, the left uh, presents in, in using racism as an all-purpose explanation for inequality. Uh, if, if, if that is true, How is it that Hispanics, who uh, have no history of slavery in America, um, are earning uh, less than black people are? How is it that Asians, who have experienced tremendous discrimination uh, at the hands of white people, uh, you had eras when uh, there were limits to what schools they could go to, what jobs Asians could have, in this country, Asians were not allowed to own property in certain states. During World War II, they were rounded up and interned. They significantly out-earned white people in this country and have for decades. How is this possible under the explanation that racism and racial prejudice and racial discrimination explains all? And you come across this time and time again when Asians are included in the equation, whether you're talking about, you know, bank loans, or 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 the number of blacks that are that are that are pushed out of uh, employment during uh, recessions, um, people always do black-white comparisons. Oh, blacks are denied for loans at higher rates than uh, uh, whites. Well, whites are denied at higher rates than Asians. If if racism is the reason then you're left with this absurd view that white bankers are discriminating against white loan applicants in favor of Asians. Um, The alternative is that other things are a factor here that we're not talking about because we stopped the discussion uh, after a consideration of racism and the role that it plays. And again, I think that that is doing a, a, a disservice not only to the national debate about these issues, 
but a disservice to um, what uh, the black underclass needs to be focused on in order to advance. And right now, the thinking is that all it should really be focused on is obliterating racism in America. And if they could just do that, everything would be hunky-dory. And I, I see no evidence that that would be the case. So let's close with um, where we started. I think you said, it seems a little, ch it was a long time ago, Jason. I think you described yourself as an optimist. Yes. Um, race relations, the role of race in the national discussion right now, is, I, is it a pretty depressing point for me? Yeah. Uh, I'm white, you're black. So I don't know how you feel about it, but the way that people talk about race right now, we're so far away from Martin Luther King's vision of a person being judged by the content of their character, identity politics, identity, race as a, as a, as a overwhelming uh, determinant of who you are and nothing else has become the norm. Oh, yeah. uh, white people or, and maybe some black people are afraid to talk about it because um, they're afraid they're going to be canceled. Uh, give me a little optimism going forward. <laughs> <laughs> give me give me something to take home as a little sure. Oh, well, well, first I, I I do share your your pessimism on this front. We've we've turned King's uh, uh, ideas on their head. Judge me by the content of my character, not the color of my skin. Uh, don't focus on my race. Now we're we're to Black Lives Matter. That is that is King in reverse. And 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 if you refuse to say that Black Lives Matter, we have a problem with you. If you say all lives matter, we have a problem with you. So that is that is anti King, and that's where we where we are right now. And I am very disturbed about that. And and the reason why, Russ, is that we, we that that element has always been out there. Um, I've taken some comfort in that it was confined to academia. It's true. It's true. <laughs> it, it was. <laughs> these were silly debates happening in seminars and and discussions between uh, intellectuals and in publications nobody else read. Uh, for decades, but now they've spilled over into the larger society. They, they're, 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 they're part of our everyday language when we talk about institutional racism and unconscious bias and, the, the, and diversity training at schools and, and critical race theory. And, and it's, it's, it's quite disturbing. This, this stuff is being taught to elementary school children. And, and critical race theory uh, is quite quite radical. This is a view that, you know, uh, white people cause all black problems and, 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 and those black problems are the responsibility of white people to solve. It, it, it asks nothing of blacks. And I find that quite disturbing. Um, and, 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 and why I'm optimistic, however, is that I think that, um, on, on balance, the American people will only put up with this nonsense for so long before they will eventually push back against it and call it out. And, and, and I, I, I think we see that happening here and there, but I, I think that that will be, that will be the case, uh, that, that the left and the progressives are really, they're really, really pushing, pushing things here. And, um, and, and I, and I think, um, They'll only be able to obscure the reality. I mean, when you have statistics like the one I mentioned in Chicago, 492 homicides, three involving police. Gee, let's have a discussion about police. Uh, that, 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 how, how, how long can that, that view hold before people say, this is, this, is, this is a sideshow. This is a second order problem. We need to focus on the real problems. And, and that's why I'm, I'm, I'm optimistic. I, I guess I have this, this enduring uh, belief in, 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 the, in the common sense of the American people and that it will, it will prevail in, in, in the long run, even if I'm a, li a little pessimistic in the short run. My guest today has been Jason Riley. Jason, thanks for being part of Econ Talk. Thank you. This is Econ Talk, part of the Library of Economics and Liberty. For more Econ Talk, go to econtalk.org, where you can also comment on today's podcast and find links and readings related to today's conversation.
The sound engineer for Econ Talk is Rich Goyette. I'm your host, Russ Roberts. Thanks for listening. Talk to you on Monday.